Welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, the forward-thinking podcast for dental professionals. Join us as we discuss hot topics in dentistry, clinical tips, continuing education, and adding value to your life and career. With your host, Jazz Gulati. Marina, thank you so much for coming on the Protrusive Dental Podcast. It's great to have you on. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks. As, um, You're always went, smiling. Call- You're always, always, always smiling. And you've got these most beautiful, whitest teeth ever. Ah, I'm like promoting my own work. <laughs> you have to, right? Because you know, so that's exactly it. You're doing, you're, you're doing veneers, you're doing cosmetic dentistry, and, and you, know, you're, you, you talk the talk, you walk the walk, right? Right. That's it. Exactly. It's, it makes my job easy because my patients will come in and they'll be like, can you give me a smile like yours? I'm like, you know what? I can. And that's half the job done. <laughs> Perfect. So, so tell my listeners a, a little bit uh, about yourself, about your um, journey and how you got into cosmetic dentistry and veneers in particular. So I have a really interesting uh, career pathway, a really unusual one, I think. Um, I, when I graduated from, from university, and at the time it was VT, so I graduated in 2002 from Guy's Hospital, which is now King's, um, and um, there was a job opening that came up um, for Harvey Nichols' first dentist, wow. and they were asking... Yeah. And, you know, so they were asking for someone that was was two years graduated and someone that was five years graduated, like as a minimum requirement. Um, And obviously I just graduated, so I didn't fulfill either of those. Um, But in my VT group, everyone was like, Marina, you have to apply for this. Like you are Harvey Nichols dentist. Um, So I was like, right, I'm going to do it. So so, so what made what made your group like uh, affiliate you with that? I mean, it's really flattering that that everyone said, look, you're 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 the girl for this job. So what what is it about? Was it the sort of uh, stuff that you were already interested? in so I think I'm quite fashiony like I quite like my clothes and my fashion and uh you know interested in the way things look and so that's what people have always known me for at university and then I guess by the VT group as well um people always assume I'm wearing designer designer stuff which I'm not necessarily but you know I like I like to put things together in a certain way um and think about what I'm wearing and maybe not repeat outfits too much <laughs> and certainly cool. more so when I when I was younger um and maybe I've relaxed a little bit about it now but, <laughs> but I'm the same still now now when I go out like I really enjoy dressing up and, and, and putting things together um and that Perfect. comes from my mother my mother's exactly the same at, at her age um you know she made sure that we were always coordinated that you know to, to like you know when we had had these long plaits and our hair bands at the bottom of our plait would, would match our top or our shoes um so, awesome. so that's that's just the, the way we, we were brought you, you up know, you know Manuel, there's, there's certain questions you you never ask women but I, I don't think this is pop- <laughs> i think i think i can ask you this but please tell me if i'm wrong how many <laughs> yeah. do you own how many shoes how many Was pairs that- of shoes do you own Oh yeah, I don't. I couldn't even count. I have shoe cupboards and shoe cupboards and shoe cupboards uh, in my house. So yeah, there's a lot of shoes, a lot of boots, and a lot of sandals, and you know, a lot of heels, every type, in every color, and every brand. <laughs> well, um, I, you know what? I, I messaged you a few weeks ago, and I said, uh, "Look, um, when I told my wife, she's also a dentist. I told, when I told my wife, uh, Manrina's agreed to come on the podcast. Uh, she was like, oh, I, I might start listening to the podcast now.' So oh, I love it." <laughs> Woman power. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cut that bit out about the shoes though, so because uh, I don't want it to get any ideas. Um, so, so I'm so sorry. You were telling about your story about Harvey and Nick. So how did I, did you get the job? Yeah. So that was yeah. So oh, but just to go back, I, I also really love the way uh, the amount of support I've got from from women through all through this journey. Um, so that's a classic example that was so beautiful of your wife to say that. Um, and there's been an, I've been inundated with, with messages from women um, on social media since I released my course um, saying that, oh, great, so great to see a female educator. And um, and, and I think that, 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 that's really lovely as well. But anyway, so yeah, well, I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, let, let's we will, go, we go will. back to my, my, my career pathway. Um, yep. So yeah, I applied, for, I applied for this job that I was very unqualified. For. Well, I had a dental degree, but that's about it um and um, it was a bit of a process so it was with Lund Osler which some of you may may know or or may not know but it was really um the first practice of its kind back in the day the first dental spa in the UK um and um the the interview process so so I was shortlisted for this interview and the interview process was was an interview with with the owner and the manager um, a written exam and we were given a recommended reading list of like five to seven cosmetic textbooks um and then a patient exam as well and they 
and they would then mark us on how the patient felt um, about being examined by us. That is so, really um, like a high level interview. I mean, it, uh, it I haven't intense. heard of an interview anyway, process quite like that. That's pretty cool. But, you know, it was an opportunity of a lifetime, like, you know, getting that job completely changed my life. I, you know, it's been such an amazing journey from there on in. And I'm so grateful uh, to Surinder for, for giving me the opportunity back then. Um, so, yeah, I think rightly so that it was it was such a process because they were looking for the right person for it. Um, mm. And so, yeah, we did. I did the 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 interview and um, and Surinder and. Um, Swinda Handel and the manager at the time liked my personality. So they were like, okay. So what, one thing was to get shortlisted and, you know, and then, then do that interview. And then there was the written exam. And because I'd just come out of university, I was really used to, to reading textbooks and absorbing knowledge. So mm. I went, you know, read all those textbooks, took it all in, did the exam and did really well in that. And then um, with a new patient exam, um, it, you know, again, we, I just come out of university. So you, we've been taught the gold standard way to do an exam and everything that ne needed to be checked. So that's the way that I did my exams. I hadn't been sort of um, ruined by... You, you hadn't like started you know, taking shortcuts just yet. You, you hadn't no. cut in corners. You were doing things by the book. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so we did all that. And, and anyway, so yeah, and, and, and it was, it was amazing when I walked in all the shortlisted dentists, it was this, this beautiful clinic with this waiting room of all these beautiful dentists. I think, you know, you'd chosen a bunch of good looking people who had a dental degree. Um, and then he, and then he, he chose from them, um, who to take for the job according to those, those three stages that we went, that we went through. So I was really fortunate uh, to get that job. Um, and at the time I told Sarinda, I was like, you know, I don't have the, the qualification, the, the experience that you, that you asked for. And he was like, well, you know, you've got the right look and the right personality. And as long as you're keen to learn, I'll teach you, I'll teach you the dentistry. Um, and That's that was amazing. it. That, so he I was like a, a mentor to you. Cute such a mentor and I think I really like the way that he was I think it's correct I think you know if I ever open my own clinic I'll do the same thing I'll take on dentists who have the right attitude they don't necessarily need to have all the skills yet um, mm -hmm. but they just need to be willing to learn um, you know without ego um, and put the hard work in and I was fully there I was like yeah I'll work any hours I'll do anything you know you tell me to do work wise um, I just want to learn um, and it was never about money it was always about just mm -hmm. just gaining the experience and, and absorbing the knowledge because uh, I wanted this so bad I wanted and I wanted I wanted to make him proud and, and feel like he made the right decision perfect and then from there your, your cosmetic dentistry experience and uh, your exposure through her mentorship grew and grew I imagine so that was 18 years ago. Yeah. That he took me, took me on. And, um, and then from there, obviously, you know, yeah, we were the first sort of dental spa in the country. Um, and then uh, we opened a clinic in Harrods as well. So then he moved me from Harvey Nichols to Harrods. Um, and then I was their first dentist. Um, and then we got the TV show 10 years younger. So um, at the time there was no Sky TV and that used to air on channel four um, at eight o'clock every Thursday night. Um, and it was only me and Surinder doing, doing spa makeovers in the clinic. So there would be 200 new patients that would, that would contact us every by, by Friday morning, trying to book in uh, to, to Lundosla. Wow. And then between the two of us, we had to do all these spa makeovers. So um, I spent my twenties um, doing veneers, <laughs> prepping veneers, like at yeah, least 10 yeah. a day. Um, and I would work, work till midnight. I would work weekends. You know, we had to get them in and I didn't mind doing it this was my priority and it was where I was happy and actually the way the clinic was we were like family so I felt like I was I was with family we were all working together anyway and we had this 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 aim to be the best and and, um, I, and I, I totally really get that, that vibe um, I mean I, I get that vibe from your Instagram stories and yeah. the way that you manage your the, the way you manage your patients and the way that you you, you get you know friendly in the right in, in, in a professional way but you really I can tell that you go the extra effort to make them feel comfortable uh, and I definitely get that vibe and the cases the volume of cases you produce of um, excellent veneer cases the reason that when I thought okay um, my, my listeners asked for um, a, a podcast episode about veneers I thought of you straight away and of course you're, you're telling me your story now about how many veneers you got to place so early on and it just reminds me of the 10,000 hour rule you know Malcolm Gladwell made it oh, famous yeah. uh, and you had such a lot of exposure to veneers early yeah. on. Uh, yeah. And so that's why I'm excited to the next half an hour or so to download as much knowledge as possible. That's reasonable within half an hour through this podcast Let's episode do it. Uh, about veneers. So uh, I obviously got a few list, a few questions with, for you. So let me start with question number one, which is probably the most common question uh, I've come across uh, with my fellow listeners is 
ceramic versus composite. We've seen composite veneers boom in the last maybe three years. I don't know what it is, but suddenly everyone's doing composite veneers now. Um, you yeah. tend to, from what I've seen on your Instagram, uh, you tend to place more porcelain veneers. What's the conversation that you have with your patients? What's your experience with ceramic versus composite veneers? And what would you advise? Yeah, so yeah, without a doubt, there's been a massive boom and there's been a really big boom actually in, in younger patients. I feel like the older patients are still coming in and asking and happy to have porcelain. But the younger patients, um, there's been a lot of scare tactics uh, around porcelain and people are really worried about their teeth being cut. And so they're like, can we do composite? Does that mean you don't have to cut my teeth? Um, and I think it's a, it's a matter, matter of a conversation. I think some people are suitable for, for composite bonding um, and that's fine and I will do that in those cases. But if it's a case that needs... Um, full labial coverage, then I would prefer to place porcelain. I think uh, where, where, where there is an advantage to, to composite is a lot of people aren't very confident with, with porcelain veneers and so perhaps they're over prepping them um, or they're worried that their porcelain veneers will fall off and so they're prepping teeth for crowns um, as opposed to veneers and so there's some quite heavy preps going on with them um, and so I understand you know what, what, why patients would want it and the risks associated with that. However, if a, if a small makeover case is done correctly and you know the, the lab I've been working with, I've been working with them for 18 years, um, they now make me these beautiful um, Emacs, I use, I use Emacs veneers and um, they can be 0.3 of a millimeter thick so they're very very thin um, they're very strong and they're very beautiful so um, where, where you're broadening the smile quite often on the, on the premolars on the side of the smile um, there's, there's no prep I just prep a margin mm -hmm. and stick mm -hmm. these veneers on so there's no risk associated with that um, or very low risk associated with that and um, in areas that, that I maybe do need to prep then I'll encourage my patients to have uh, pre-alignment pre first so I'll align the teeth accordingly mm -hmm. so again there's very very little prep needed um, and because ortho has also evolved massively, um, it's very quick, quick and easy now to move teeth. It's not like the old age, you're not asking patients to wear brackets. And so there's a really big take up of that. Um, I don't what percentage of your patients would you say um, have both uh, like an ortho restorative treatment from you rather than purely restoratively driven? Yeah. So percentage wise, um, most I would say more than not, we'll have some sort of ortho first, um, even if it's just a few clear aligners. Um, so maybe I'd say 60, 40. Um, some patients come to me with already straight teeth. They've had ortho as a child. They may mm -hmm. even still have retainers on. Um, mm -hmm. And then they're, they're having, they're, they, you know, they've, they've worn their te teeth away because of a grinding habit. I mean, that's a massive issue um, everywhere, but certainly in London. Um, and so then the teeth are already straight and then it's not, it's not really an issue. I, I completely agree with you. And that's why I, I went on to study an ortho diploma because I figured out, you know, what I like doing is toothway cases and bigger cases. And, and what, what I see is that I think, I think, yeah, 60, 70 percent of patients who, who need a rehabilitation would benefit from orthodontics because it means you can do a, a more minimally invasive job. So you mentioned obviously yeah. that, you know, if you're only um, doing zero in, in some cases doing 0 0.3 millimeters, and that's going to be quite yeah. invasive. But what technique would you use? Because some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you use the, the Gurel technique or, or whatever. I don't know. But what, what techniques can you do to, yeah. to teach my listeners about how to be more minimal? Because what you don't want to do, yes. as, as some dentists have done, and I, and I know this, is that they look, they open up Schillingbergs and they see that, oh, a veneer needs to be prepped 0 0.8 millimeters. And no matter what the position of teeth is, you'll just prep 0 0.8 millimeters everywhere, which we know is not the right way to do. But for those who are less experienced in veneers, can you please explain your protocol? Yeah. Does that so, make sense? So that's... Yeah, so I think it's really important uh, before you uh, try and do something like this for your patient. It's a cosmetic treatment that they don't necessarily need to have, but they want to have. And it's not something that you're taught how to do at university. So it's very important to go on some sort of course and learn how to do this properly, learn about wax ups and how to set up a case um, and make sure that your, your work is going to last. Um, and, and on my course, again, uh, the way that I taught it was that um, we, do a, we, we do a wax up take impressions of the smile, design the new smile, get a wax up made of that, and then get a putty index made um, of the wax up that can be placed in the mouth um, over the teeth. So it's a putty index just on the incisal edges of the teeth, um, and you place that in the mouth, and then from there you can see which bits need to be removed uh, so that the veneer won't won't stick out and so that that's what we do with with the delegates as you sit and you look at it and then you mark those areas sorry are you going to say something no no no, 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 no. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, no. so you as you were saying that i mean okay. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do that a lot by the way so i hope that doesn't put you off but uh, yeah, um, so so you've got the putty in, i'm going to make it very tangible so lots of learning yeah. points you know lots of learning points in this so you've got the putty index on what is the typical 
labial reduction, which are the 0.3 millimeter cases and which are the 0.7 millimeter cases? How do you differentiate? You look at, yeah, you look at your party index and then you have a look at, at the, how much space you have labially. And then you see if you have that sort of point in a standard case, you have 0.3 millimeters and anywhere you don't, um, you would just remove, you would just remove the, the extra bit of, of mm -hmm. tissue. Mm -hmm. So I mark it and then you can remove it. And then you put the index in again so that you can see that, uh, so that you can see you've taken off the excess. Mm -hmm. Now, also there's the burr. Um, and actually, I've even got the number of the burr because I was just making a list. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, I mean, if you, if you read it out and then I can I mean, always put it in the blog post as well, that'd be great. Yeah, but my uh, listeners I mean, love burr codes. I need to take I need to take you for a walk though, so I'm gonna take you for a walk. Let's go. Let's go for a tour. Yeah. Let's go for a, a, a <laughs> yeah. tour. Sh sh yeah. Share road. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So uh, obviously, so... the the, the, the burr will aid you to prep the correct amount. So uh, it's like a guide, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. So we've got the 0.3 reduction um, burr. Um, so the burr that I use um, to prep with, so to actually prep my margins, um, I use the six. So this is a farm comet. So the 6844.314.014. And also the 016. You'll have to write that down because that's going no, to be too fine, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. So what I'll do is at the exact moment that um, I play this bit uh, and people are watching this, yeah. magically in my hand, the burr will appear over here. So, uh, but I'll, I'll put Maybe. that on. So when people need to con contact Comet to buy it. So obviously, you know, I was explaining to my listeners uh, um, in, in, a, in my last episode, actually, or two episodes ago about how to interpret burr code. So the, the last four digits would mean how um, uh, thick it is at, at the tip. So what you're suggesting there is the 1.4 and the oh. 1.6, but only part of that is the, is, the, is, yeah, is, is the diamond that's cutting. And then by using that burr, uh, is it the one that's like uh, the Christmas tree shape? Like it's got little bits on, right? Like uh, it's got a gap. Oh, no, this is, so this, oh yeah, so this is, this, is, uh, this is a prep burr. So this is for doing the actual margins. Okay. So it's just, it's just, it's just a straight burr. It's just a straight burr. All oh, right, cool. With, with a red, with a red and green margin. But yeah, cause just uh, looking at the list and then uh, they've got the, da, da, da. so it looks like, you know what? I haven't got, uh, I haven't got it written next to it, but I can get Just send it to you. me and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put it on. Yeah. So, so, so Manrina's burrs that she recommends, we'll yeah. put that on as a little yeah. post. I know, I'm gonna contact them and get this made as a burkit. Uh, the problem is it's from Dental Directory and Comet. They can do two different places. So I don't know, I don't know mm -hmm. who's, who's gonna make this burkit for me. Um, they'll they'll yeah, be I'm fighting, gonna... they'll be fighting to make your burkit, Marie. Fighting, yeah, there you go. Um, and so yeah, one of these two um, will be the, the depth reduction burr. But yeah, I'll double check which one it is and make sure I'm giving you the right number. Do you, do you um, use that technique where once you've um, uh, uh, sort of, um, made a uh, temporary or once you've uh, done mm. a trial smile then you mm. prep and then you color it in i see that being as a, a technique like you color in with a pencil where uh, it hasn't been reduced yeah. enough is that something that you use yeah so we use a pencil a lot so first of all when you put the party index on use a pencil to remove the bits that are jutting out that stop the mm -hmm. index from sitting comfortably um, and then um, you, go, you go ahead with with this depth reduction burr and over you know on the areas so on the premolars, where you can see there's all, say you're broadening and you can see there's already enough space, don't even bother doing this. But for the teeth, where you can see that you're just at the at the margin, at the putty margin, this is quite difficult to explain uh, without having a visual aid. Through audio only of, yeah, I know what you mean, but yeah. don't, try, 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 try your best. And yeah. If we, if we, if, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll try. If it doesn't make much sense, then yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. You we'll do some videos. Course. Oh yeah, we'll have to do a video, yeah. yeah. So then, um, then you use the depth reduction burr, you put it parallel to the tooth, you go across the labial surface, and then you take a pencil and you mark the depth, and, and then you can make sure you prep until you've removed the pencil, and then you know you've removed enough. But actually, again, on my course, we do, it, we do this two ways. So first of all, first of all I showed them the gallop Gorel technique. Um, so we'll go through that as well. Should we go through mm -hmm. that now? Yeah, okay. so, what, so what is yeah. the Gallic Girl <laughs> technique and then what is the Manrina technique? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the Manrina technique is the one that I just, that I just told you. That's how, okay. I, how typically I will do it. I will use the putty index. So I will take my putty index, I'll cut it to the incisal, I'll place it over the teeth, I'll mark where I need to reduce, and then I'll just go through eyeballing and reducing where I need to. Um, but originally, I used to do it Gallic's way. Um, the reason why, why I stopped doing that 
is because um, I think it's a really good aid initially, but sometimes um, it can mean that when you put the actual temporaries on, they're not as smooth um, as they are unless when you're using the stent for the first time. Because I think a little okay. bit of resin stays on the stent, and so mm -hmm. yeah, just 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 for the sake of that. But but as a learning aid, it's really good. It's a really good technique. So the way that works, yes, we do it. Yeah, is um, when you when you do your setup. So you have your wax up done. You, you you design your wax up. You have it created. You have this incisal index made, um, and you also get a temporary stent made so that you can place your temporaries. Um, so at the beginning of the appointment. Actually, and I think there might still be some benefit here to, to putting the incisal index on and still removing the little extra bits that you can see mm -hmm. obviously jut out. If there are those bits, hopefully you've done your pre-alignment and there aren't, so that's not even yep. an issue. Yep. Um, then you fill the, the stent with temporary material, so that would be ProTemp or Luxatemp um, or whatever brand you decide, decide to use. Um, and then you pop that in the mouth, and those temps can be in any color. And then you take the steps reduction burr, you hold it flat against the, the, the tooth and, and you put your, your depth marks through the temporary. Mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. you take your pencil, you mark the depth marks, just as we, we talked about doing just now on the tooth. And, um, and then you peel off the temporary and you see whether any of those uh, pencil marks actually marked, um, marked your teeth. And actually, um, I think when we did that just now, did it just now um, on, on my course for the patient we were doing there, I mean, we may have got one little pencil mark. Like most of, most of the teeth didn't need any prep, uh, which yeah. is really interesting. Because then suddenly you're like, oh, I would have gone ahead with the depth burr and cut all of these away. And actually that there was no need to, to get to the, the final result that, that we're wanting. So a lot of these uh, areas uh, are going to be additive and uh, through the wax up and, and a lot of these um, yeah. are, are therefore very minimal. So that's, uh, that's the way to do it rather than just going around prepping an arbitrary number. You've got to begin that's with the it. end in mind, like you said, with the wax up yeah. and the, the control process. So the only question that comes to, to my mind is how do you factor in a tooth that might be slightly more discolored? So that, let's say you've yeah. got um, a, 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 a darker like central incisor. Yeah. Or, or, or let, so let's say the scenario where they're all dark teeth or the yeah. other scenario, which is very annoying, is when actually one tooth is darker. Can you talk, tell us about how you would uh, treat in a veneer case that, any differently in, in your hands? Yeah. Oh, no, of course. Yeah. So you'd have to prep. You'd have to prep much deeper. And actually within the depth reduction burrs, we have um, a 0.3 millimeter and a 0.5 millimeter depth reduction burr so that we can prep a little bit further. And you may even want to prep a little further than that, to be honest. Um, and it depends how you decide you want to, you want to tackle the case. Um, you may decide that if it's a full tetracycline case, for example, it's all quite dark, you'll prep it all a little bit, a little bit heavier. So you're looking at at least 0.5 millimeter reduction, maybe even a little bit more than that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Looking at, I mean, I, I can't give you an exact amount, but I would do 0.5 sure. and then go a little bit further with it. Sure. Um, so that the lab have got space to place the layers to mask out the, the depth of color. But if it's a single tooth or if it's just isolated areas that are quite dark for some, some reason, then I'll prep just that area deeper and I'll mask the darkness uh, with a composite, so with, with a quite opaque com composite. Oh, okay. Like a, yeah, something so like the, a, the, the pink opaque, like that sort of stuff? Or, or like yeah, an so opaque pink, resin? Yeah, just, a, just an opaque composite. So uh, within, within my, my set of my Venus Pearl composites, uh, which is what I'm using at the moment, um, yeah, there's, there's some opaque, opaque, opaque I don't know, pacifiers or opaquers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There. So I'll take quite an opaque shade and just stick that on um, so that I've done the job for, for the lab and then they're not masking anything but, for me. But importantly, um, what, the lab, what the lab get is, uh, is, is a cast, right? So uh, tell us about mm -hmm. your documentation, which then aids yeah. the color. And, and, and which percentage of your patients are you actually sending to the lab uh, to actually get some you know, custom shade match? Or, or is it all mostly through photography and your relationship with your laboratories? Yeah, so for uh, a small makeover, so any actually, usually even just for four units, um, or and more than that, so four, six, eight, ten, whatever, twenty, twenty-four, whatever. Um, I'll, I'll just it'll all be through my own. Um, I'll take the records myself and I'll let the lab know what it is that I want. Um, but for majority, if not all, ninety-nine percent of single centrals, I'll send them to the lab. Okay, perfect. But then the, the photos you're sending uh, mm -hmm. tells the laboratory the starting shade or the dye shade, mm -hmm. as you want to call it, stump shade mm -hmm. as it used to be called, so that the, the lab know exactly what color they're starting yeah. off with, right? What's yeah, the, so they have the all most, the information. What's the most popular shade 
that uh, patients uh, and yourself and the patients select in, in your clinic? BL3. Is that the whitest Everyone or is BL4 or yeah. what? Uh, BL1 is the, is the whitest. So okay. I always tell my, you know, my patients quite often will come in and then I'll be like, we're going to do these in BL3 because BL3 is my favorite. And they'll be like, oh, okay, let's have a look. And then, you know, they'll always pick up BL1 and be like, can't we do this color? Um, uh -huh. And I, I always tell them the story that, uh, you know, I've done over 10,000 ceramics in my, uh, 10,000 veneers in my career. And in, within that, I've only done two cases um, in BL1. And one of them, uh, she came, had her teeth done, paid me. 15 grand um insisted on on having them done in bl1 i was like don't do it don't do it don't do it and she was like no 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 this is what i want to do so in the end fine we did them in bl1 um, and she came back the following year and said you were right you're too light had them redone in a2 and had to pay me another 15 grand to do it a2 so, like to go from bl1 yeah. to a2 is a significant jump <laughs> She'd had enough, like she, yeah, like she knew that they were too white, and she hated them so much that she was like, just, just give me. And then there was another argument, right? Because I'm like, at least let's do B1. Yeah. So now let's do them in, in A2, and I show pictures of that case uh, again on my course because it's just it's awesome. such an interesting one. That, that yeah, is a great learning point, and then you know that. about communication. Yeah. yeah, really good. And most so most that, of them do. Yeah. Be on, to be honest, most of them they start saying they won't be a one, and then by the end of the conversation, they're like, okay, I'll trust you on this. Let's do BL3, and BL3 is a great color. Awesome. Similar to so before, but, so similar, I was going to say what shade are you, but then I was also going to ask you what shade is Simon Cowell? <laughs> yeah, probably a BL1. Okay, yeah. fine. So you just so use that example. Bad. No one wants teeth like Simon Cowell, so just use it. <laughs> some, some do. Some do. Like, like, yeah, they'll start, they'll start all saying, don't make me look like Simon Cowell. And then they'll like pick up a piece of paper and be like, oh, can we do it in this color? And you're like, oh. no, you didn't want to look like him. But also it's to do with the anatomy. And so you can get mm. away with like a much whiter color if, if you put the correct anatomy in. And that's something really important to understand with the patient. You know, I'll, some people will say, don't ask your patients. Oh, it's so annoying when patients send in pictures of celebrities um, because how are you going to make them look like a celebrity? Whereas I always ask my patients to do that. I say, send me pictures of smiles that you like because it gives me an idea about their vibe, whether sometimes what they say and what they actually want doesn't, doesn't correlate. So once they send pictures, I'm like, okay, that's what Interesting. You want. Okay. That's yeah. it. I, I see what you mean there. Very good. Uh, the next thing I want to ask then is, um, do you follow an occlusion camp? Like some people are like following like Panky or Dawson. Uh, yeah. People know what I think and whatnot. But what, well, how do you manage the cases where you have got tooth where people are parafunctioning or bruxing? So you need mm. to be a little bit smart about the way you design the occlusion, particularly if you're placing lower veneers, because that's taken the sort of uh, including, you know, the whole guidance uh, involved in the, the fact that the the, the, the sort of the forces going on a lower veneer is completely different to what goes in the upper veneer. So how do you manage just a few points about occlusion management with your veneer cases? Yeah, so um, I'm really big on occlusion. I teach occlusion to DFTs um, every year in the VT scheme. Um, awesome. And that's always scary. Scary how little they know. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I did, I, did the Dawson, um, I did the Dawson courses over three years in Florida uh, back in the day, like 2004, 2007. That's so much that more time. glamorous. You went to Florida and I have to go to the Wirral. I love that though, Ian Buckle. So I studied um, Aesthetic Advantage with Larry Rosenthal and you know, Ian was studying at the same time as me. So I got to know him wow. back then in 2004. And then, you know, at the time we were both learning all these things and yeah, he was learning about Dawson, I was learning about Dawson and then obviously he went on to teach it. And I always recommend people uh, who ask me about pollution to go to the Wirral and learn with him because I think that's a really good, that's a really good course. That is um, such a great story. Yeah, I, I never knew, I never, I never knew that you and uh, Ian sort Ian of went to the same other. place to, yeah. to learn. That is so cool. Honestly, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you, yeah. you need to send Ian some of the, the cream that you use though. Uh, <laughs> you need to send him some 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 of the the sort of the the, the moisturizers and whatnot. <laughs> Sorry, Ian, I love you really, mate. I'm going to see you in March. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Ian. I'm doing the Dawson Academy at the moment in the world at the moment, so I'm seeing uh, Ian in March, and he's he's probably he's probably going to kick my ass for, for if he listens yeah. to this. So hopefully he won't. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, cool. so you you did the Dawson in Florida. Is that with Pete Dawson himself and Cranham and some yeah, other? Yeah, exactly. Wow. So Cranham was teaching us and Pete Dawson was around, but he gave, maybe he gave the odd lecture. Yeah. Um, and actually, oh my God, I've got his, his book like right here uh, because I was referring to it. Yeah, for some slides that I was writing for my course. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so yeah, so that's, 
the that's my that's my thought that that's where my learning is from and um occlusion is massively important because i can't have my my veneers fail and um so i'm not worried about my veneers debonding they're not going to debond and the technique that i use um they show you know re re vitro studies have shown that you can hang a man off the veneer and it won't debond so that's not my concern uh, my concern is patients breaking their veneers and okay. anything that can break yeah, exactly. Um, anything that will break will break a tooth will break your veneer. That's what I tell them. So I'm like, you know, your grinding habit. The reason your teeth are already worn is because of this habit that we need to control, um, and um, and we need to, to reset your bite as it should be. And also, obviously, biting fingernails and eating penne, mm -hmm. opening packets with teeth, uh, opening bottles with teeth, um, and, and and all these other things. So that's a conversation that we that we always have. Um, but my patients are always restored um, into canine guidance, um, and we look. So we check that, that it's the canines that are taking taking the load on their on their lateral excursions, um, and we have a look at protrusive, and we check that that the bite is set up correctly. But also, um, if they're grinding on their back, so so okay, eighty five percent of my patients grind their teeth, and that's because people in London grind their teeth. Like living in London agree. is, is agree. stressful, right? Crossing the road is stressful. Getting on the tube is stressful. These people, you know, everyone's stressed. <laughs> I grind my teeth, you know, while I'm working, I love big my time. job. Big time, I do, big while time. while I prep, yeah, I clench release, clench release, and my nurse will see me doing it. And um, and actually, I've, I've Botoxed my masseters because I had this really quite square face uh, from from my grinding habit. And so, yeah, I stuck some Botox in there. So, so tell and... me, on that, just on that point, do you feel like a reduction in your bite force? Yeah, of course. It's massive, massively reduced. So I can eat and drink as normal, but I used to eat packs of nuts. Like I would just empty out a yeah. whole pack of nuts, which was, which was too many nuts, right? So it wasn't, this is what I tell my patients. I'm like, you can't eat a pack of nuts after I Botox your masseters, but you can eat a few nuts, which is all you should be eating anyway. So now yeah. when I try to do that, my master gets tired and I stop. I have a few and I stop. Interesting. Um, so the feeling is that after a few nuts, you, 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 you get tired. That's tired. what happens, right? Yeah. And that's why I'm wow. not grinding as well. So I, I go to grind and then, and then I'm tired and then I stop. So I feel like I'm going off course here. So good to go. Yeah. So, the re so we look at patients and they either grind on their back teeth or they grind on their front teeth. You know, they have all these strange habits. Some just grind on one side. Um, and you want to have a look at what that habit is and look at their, their wear pattern and try and work out um, what it is that they're doing. Um, and then um, you want to try and manage that habit for them. So if they are not just clenching really nicely and it's not really nice it's really bad um, on their molars and, and cracking all of them um, then it will be because um, because there's a prematurity back there so there's something that's that's uncomfortable for them to bite on at the back um, and so in that case I know that I want to equilibrate equilibrate them so that if they are, are going to continue with this grinding habit and they're not going to follow protocol and wear their night guard or put Botox their masters or, or the other things that we'll discuss um, then at least they're, they're grinding on their back teeth so there's there's bigger teeth to take the force rather than them trying to break the porcelain work that I put in their mouth. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot of my patients get equilibrated. So you're taking the loads, um, in your case, you're taking the loads away from the anteriors uh, from, for your veneers yeah. are, uh, but then are, yeah. is, are all of your veneer patients um, given a, a splint or a retainer or, you know, or, or not really, or it depends. Yeah. Your... Yeah. So the majority, the vast majority of them are, and some of them will refuse it because they say, I'm not going to use it. And in those cases, I'll usually give them, one anyway and then I might just give it free of charge and just say at least I felt like I've given it to you but then I'm aware that they're that they're not going to use it and then we have a further conversation about what we're going to do about that so yeah potentially it's Botox for the masseters which is really appealing to women and so a lot of them mm -hmm. um, you know will do that as part of their treatment plan um, but for some of the men because it's it's slimming for your face you know they want their big jaw and so they you know they don't want to do that and so then I just need to check where, where those loads are going and what I also what I'll do for, for a lot of them is show them pictures of really horrible, um, really horrible wear cases and tell them, you know, this is the sort of thing that I see every day. That's why I'm paranoid about eating my enamel. It never grows back. And so I wear my night guard every night. Doesn't matter what time I go to bed or, you know, what I've been doing, I will go and I'll put that in because I'm paranoid about it. So I would like you to be paranoid about it too and show them why. And equally for their, for their ceramic work, it's like you've got this beautiful smile now. You haven't loved your smile. You haven't looked after it brilliantly. But now you love it and it's very expensive. So if you love it, look after it. And you're going to have to wear this to sleep. And, and to be fair, the majority of them will Boom. Be say, okay, Marina. Yeah. That I was amazing. Like that whole minute, that's going to be my opening snippet of the podcast. I really like that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to like memorize exactly word for word and say it to my patients just like that. that, was, that I really like that. Thank you for sharing that. 
I feel like I should I should like record and press play because I have so many like pre-recorded you have, things you're, that you're, I you're, say. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's patient communication. That's the crux of it. So you know, you, you said to a patient that you know I want you to be paranoid like I am. I really like that. Yeah. So tell me about. Uh, let's talk about some patient management. Uh, moving away yeah. from the truth slightly, we might come back to it. But patients who come and ask for veneers, okay, they can yeah. be characters sometimes. Let's call it right. Yeah. Um, some of them may even have body dysmorphia, which is a, a real problem nowadays. Um, do you ever encounter difficult characters, the kind that, you know, uh, the expectations are so high that it, it's not even real? Like no matter what uh, job you do, what they're after is, is, is just never going to happen. And, uh, it's difficult to make it tangible because every case is different. But do you see what I mean? I mean, some people call them crazies or, or whatever, but there is a group of people that, you know, I, I would get nervous to treat. So do you get patients like yeah. that? Not because you don't feel like you have the right skills because obviously you play so many units, uh, but it's just that their expectations are just something else. Yeah. So, I mean, I talk, again, I talk about this on, on my, on my course. Um, I don't have that issue very often. Um, and I think, it's because um, I've been in high-end cosmetic dental treatments my whole career. You know, that's all I've known since I graduated. So at Lundosla, where I started, um, it was known for being the most expensive clinic in the country. And the reason that people came to us were because we were the most expensive and they showed off about it over dinner. And so that in itself attracts a certain type of patient that's looking for the most expensive clinic. Um, and so I started off with that type of patient, right? The really demanding patient who's really, really needs everything to be perfect. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I put in place throughout the small makeover process uh, to make sure that I don't end up with an unhappy patient. Um, the first thing is that at the initial consultation, uh, we use Photoshop um, and I'll put the patient's face up and on Photoshop, I'll start showing them what, what the smile that we're designing will look like. Um, if they've got, say, a midline diastema, then I'll show them examples of closing di the diastema, leaving the diastema. But because we're using Photoshop and not just using um, a perfect smile stuck onto that patient's face is showing them what what's actually realistically achievable for them. Um, I do a lot of gum surgery. Do, do, with do my you patients. teach that? Do you teach that on your course? Or how to manipulate yeah. images on Photoshop? Yeah, so there's a really small part, an introduction to it. Um, but actually, Tim Bradstock Smith, um, who owns the clinic where I work now, um, is planning on doing a full a full course about that. So he's just in the process of, of setting that up. So it's like an but introduction. You do this, Marina. You do this yourself, like on Photoshop. You're doing yeah. the Photoshop yeah. stuff. That's yeah, so I do that cool. for, my, for my patients. I mean, yeah, it takes a while, a while to learn it, which is why I can't teach the full part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I show a really basic version of it on my course, but then say go on the full day course if you want to learn about it properly. And I do the same mm -hmm. thing with photography. I show a really basic version, but do recommend that you go and do a full day course to learn about it. I like the idea my, of manipulating the patient's own teeth rather than putting yeah. some other teeth there. So what you, what you said there, I, I really like. So, okay. So you'll yeah. manipulate and on then, Photoshop. So that's one part of communication. Yeah. What else would you do? But also within within that, mm -hmm. um, quite often I um, for for would say more than half, at least half of my patients, I move their gums as well. So I do my own gum surgery, um, and so the Photoshop's really useful for that because they'll be like, oh no, my gums are fine. But then once you start moving things, they can see that for symmetry they're not fine. And then even though that seems like an added expense and a procedure that they don't necessarily want, they see that that visual benefit of it. And so that's why they often they'll go for uh, go for the gum surgery mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they'll see how short their teeth are compared to the length they should be. So they also become aware of how much damage they've done. And then they're more likely to take their grinding habit more seriously, because usually at that stage, they're not even aware of their grinding habit. So the first mm -hmm. stage is convincing them that they've even got it. So, yeah, first thing, so Photoshop. And then um, we do the wax up and then obviously I show them the wax up and I put it in their mouth. And then after the, the prep appointment, they've got their temporaries on and then I do a review appointment two days later. Um, and so at that stage, we look at the temporaries and we talk about the color and we talk about the shape. Um, and if they don't walk in that room and say to me, oh, Manuela, I love them, then we're not leaving that appointment or we're not leaving that stage until that's their, their reaction to their temporaries. So, um, I mean, most, most of the time we achieve that in that one appointment, but if we don't, I'm happy to leave them in temporaries for a month and just keep seeing them every few days until we have something that they're like, oh, these are amazing and this is exactly what I want. So, so I think what that, kind that of really tweaks helps. would you have to do in, in a typical case to, to get them happy? Would you have to completely put a new set of uh, temporaries that are a different shape usually or color or what? 
Yeah, so no, we never, we, I, I can't remember the last time I changed the templates completely, but you change them yourself. So I take global composite and I can make them shorter or I'll take a soft flex disc and I'll make them, sorry, soft flex disc make them shorter, global mm -hmm. composite make them longer. If they feel, uh, if they feel too wide, I'll change the line angles. Um, sometimes myself, I want to change the, the, you know, we have this whole conversation about midlines. Um, the human eye will see uh, the midline can be up to four millimeters to either mm -hmm. side and the human eye won't see it. So, you know, at that initial consultation, we go through midlines and I'll say to them, you know, your midline's not quite, quite in the middle. Um, uh, but if I want to move it for you, I'm going to have to prep the teeth more. So it's less than four millimeters. Should we accept it where it is? And, you know, they'll be like, yeah, that's fine. Um, but then once everything else is perfect, maybe it's not fine. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so that, that gives them an opportunity as well at that stage, stage to look at that. The other thing I do is I make, and you may have seen this video on my Instagram uh, recently when I, when I was showing, showing you a patient I did this with, the lab will make both the laterals uh, asymmetrical. So yeah. uh, something that I'll often do um, in my small makeovers is, you know, the centrals need to be very symmetrical. I want everything to be very symmetrical, but if you wanted to add some asymmetry so that, um, so that it wasn't too perfect to smile, yep. then I would add it within the lateral. So anyway, in the wax up, we make the, the laterals two different shapes. And then at this conversation, we say, okay, which one, which one do you like better? And sometimes they'll say, oh, I really like that they're different. Or they'll say, oh, I like the round one. I like the square one. Um, sometimes the teeth can feel too square and then we'll open up embrasures and they can feel too, too wide and then we'll change line angles uh, to make them look more narrow. You know, they can feel too long, they can feel too short, they can feel too white. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll put a glaze on to darken them. Um, ah, so there's so, so, so much you can do using their own temporaries with yeah. modifications. Oh yeah. And I don't have them saying they want them whiter because I always put them on the same or whiter than I think they would want. So if anything, they'll go darker. So I don't have that problem. Because that's hard to what's, change. What's your wider. record for the longest time you've kept some temporaries because there's so many modifications to do? Oh, it wasn't modifications, but one guy just disappeared for six <laughs> months. He loved his temp so much. And we kept calling him saying, come in for your finals, come in for your finals. He was like, no, I'm fine. I'm good. You're like, you don't understand. Um, my patients love their temps. And so they don't typically want to come back. So this finals. guy's temporary survived the whole six months? Yeah, yeah, and they can. Yeah, you know. They well can. done. So, so one. You know, today I, I I put my Instagram story today, right? I asked um I asked everyone, uh, have you got any questions for Manrina? So one of the questions I, I got was, tell us about uh, multi-unit uh, veneer temporization. So can you tell us about how you make temporaries? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we use that stent that we talked about earlier. So the lab, it's a lab-made stent copy of the wax up. And um, so when, when you're ready for your temps, I, um, I spot etch the teeth that you want to temporize. So just a little drop of etch um, and then a little drop of bond um, and, and cure that. And then you take the stent um, and you fill that up as a single unit with either pro temp or lux temp, whichever one you've decided to use. Um, and then you pop that in the mouth. And you also squeeze a little bit on your gloves so you can check when it's set. Um, and then my, my stent is typically two layers. So I'll like almost like a special tray with the stent inside. So then I'll take off the special tray and have a look how it's looking and then peel off the, the stent so the temporaries left, are left in the mouth um, and then remove all the excess and clean it up. Um, and, 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 and then I use a mosquito burr, which I have a number for that here as well. 582 mosquito from dental territory. I'll comment maybe. I mean, we have to cool. give you a list of these. Um, uh -huh. and, and so then I go, I go through and, and clean up interproximally. So even though they're all stuck together, they look like separate units. Brilliant. So they're, they're linked together and you're using the, uh, it, it, they're shrink fit then, right? So you're not using any uh, bond, mm. they're shrink fit. Cool. Uh, and and spot, then spot etch, spot, etch and bond, spot etch and bond on every tooth. Yep. And then the, so the visicryl will just wrap over. Yeah. You don't want, uh, you want them to be stuck to every tooth. So even if something was to break, they would still stay um, on the individual teeth. But you don't want them to be so well stuck that you can't flick them off when it comes to removing them. And because the temporary material is so sort of stiff, um, it doesn't, um, it, it's, all, yeah, it's all sort of stuck together and it stays solid in there anyway. So it's not easy to take off anyway when it comes to taking it off. Perfect. That's answered your question, Jamie. I think you asked that uh, today. So thank you very much for answering that. Um, so I want to now ask you about your bonding protocol. So now your veneers are there. The patients approved the temporaries. Uh, tell us about your bonding protocol. Rubber dam, no rubber dam. Which cement are you using heated composite? Are you using Panavia? I mean, there's so many ways to do it. What, 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 what is your usual pro uh, protocol? Okay. So I used to use rubber dam and I used to use a split dam. Um, but um, 
I like to see the whole face when I'm bonding, <clears throat> to see to see what's going on and see how these teeth look. Because um, I always tell my patients that nine out of ten times I will fit this case at the fit appointment, but one out of ten times I won't. And if I go to fit and something doesn't look perfect to me, I'm not going to fit it. So I'll just put their tempies back on and I'll send them back and, and get them changed. So I kind of need to see the face, uh, the position of the nose and the eyes um, and everything else while I'm bonding. So I moved from rubber dam to using an obturgate. Mm -hmm. So I use an gate just to keep the lips out of the way. Um, I had like really nice suction for my nurse, keep things dry. I put some gauze on the tongue just in case I drop any, any veneers uh, yep, so it doesn't go down, down the throat. And then, um, so first of all, uh, we remove the temps and then I take my veneers. Um, they're already on the model, so they're already set up. I know which tooth is going to go where in the mouth. And my nurse does the same thing on her side. Um, she, she draws a chart so she can put the relevant veneer on the relevant tooth because I've had problems in the past where the nurse gives you, or you, you know, you ask for the wrong veneer, you ask for the upper left tooth, but yeah. you meant the upper right tooth, or, or the nurse gives you the wrong veneer and then you go to stick it and it's a mess. And you really, because you're sticking 10 veneers on at the same time, you really need the process to be smooth and easy. Um, so, um, so I take the, uh, so it's obturgate, gauze, take mm -hmm, the tooth mm -hmm. off the model, dip it in water. So the water gives me, gives it a little bit of sort of sticking power to the tooth. Okay. So I was, like was going to ask you that, how you do that. So yeah, you do it with water. Cool. With water. Yeah. And, and try and paste if need be. But first okay. of all, I'll do with water, <clears throat> water and see. Um, and then, and then I place them all in the mouth and, and, and check and I look at everything and check out. I'm happy with it. If I'm not, if I feel like, oh, they look a bit white or a bit dark or something compared to the lowest, say you're not veneering all the teeth, or say you're just doing four and you want to match it to the other teeth, um, then, um, then I use a try-in paste. So um, it's from, uh, from Ivoclar, um, and it's called Verilink, the kit that I mm -hmm. use. And um, so they have all these try-ins. They have, they have white and opaque. I normally go for translucent because mostly you don't have to make a change. Uh, but sometimes you'll use bleach. Uh, so yeah, let's make, and then you also have yellow and you have brown. So there's lots of different shades that you can use. And then I'll pop the try-ins in. And usually at that stage, um, I'll show the patient as well and be like, okay, this is what I've decided. This is what they look like. And they'll be like, oh my God, amazing. Like, yeah, let's do this. Great. Then um, I take off each veneer um, one at a time. As mm -hmm. I take them off, I wash off, um, I wash them. I wash and dry with my three in one. The nurse holds a plastic cup for me to wash and dry them with. And then she goes and puts them uh, on their relevant chart. So as I give them to her, I say upper left one. And then whatever I say, she has to repeat. Um, and that's always awkward for new nurses that come to work with me because they said, it, you know, it feels so extra. But it's only because But it's I've a had system. It's a system. It's yeah. I like that. And also, I've got all these little systems in place just because of, as a problem has occurred in my career over the years, uh, I put a system in place to make sure that never happens again. So there's lots Brilliant. of them, but that's, and, that, and that's one of them um, that we always do. So I say, and then she repeats, and the same thing when she passes to me. And then she has them all. And then on her end, she etches them. Um, and then she places monobond, which is the silane. Um, mm -hmm. And then she, and then I use um, Optibond FL uh, as my for my bonding. And so she places Optibond FL bond, like the Optibond FL two, uh, yeah. on the on the veneers on the fit surface. And then she covers them over so that that doesn't set. And in the meantime, in the mouth, um, I etch all the all the dentine and enamel. I just do it as one, one big block. And then I go through and then I wash all my etch off. Um, and then I have a little uh, Daffin's dish full of primer and uh, this still Opt Optibond FL number one. And then I soak each tooth in primer and I just keep soaking it, soaking it and watching mm -hmm. the tooth absorb um, all the liquid and then, and then just keep going. And then once I've done all that, uh, then um, sometimes I'll take, if I feel like there's still excess around, like it's soaked and I put some more on and now it's not soaking it up anymore, then I'll take the large suction and just suction around any excess. Um, and then I do the same thing with bonds. So I have a dappled dish and then I go and I soak every tooth with bond and then I'll take the suction just to make sure it's a nice thin layer. And then whichever order I tried the veneers on in, I cement mm -hmm. in that same order. So again, that's another little veneer hack that, that you can Brilliant. get caught out at. If you don't do it in the same order, then that may, that may be the only order they fit in. So if you try and change your order, um, they, may, they may not sit next to each other um, as nicely or be really difficult and you don't want that stress when you're about to cement so in that same order upper right one up typically it's upper right one upper left one upper right two upper left two and so on and so forth i take the veneer i could take my varial link so normally it's trans uh, for just a, a veneer i'll use a trans just base um, and for something thicker um an inlay onlay a veneer onlay um, i'll use base plus catalyst 
So it's got, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's got a dual formula in the very link. Squeeze that mm -hmm. onto the fit surface uh, and then put it on the tooth. And as I place it on the tooth, um, I want to see uh, cement squeeze out. And again, yep. the amount of cement you put is really important because you want to put enough that you see it squeeze out. You don't want to put so much that it's thick to squeeze on because these veneers are very thin and you don't want to mm. risk breaking them. So you don't want to put, you don't want to use force when you're placing them. H has that ever happened to you as you're placing it and it's like uh, broken? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. That's why it all happens these things to, have come happened to most, happen. exactly. Yeah. The, and I hence why the systems and hence why we yeah, are, exactly. Of course, Lovely. Of course, it'd be ridiculous to, to think that everything is in place because of things that have gone wrong <laughs> over the Perfect. years initially. Um, and, and that's what I think young dentists or dentists starting out need to know that, yeah, it is scary and definitely don't do this sort of treatment without having some sort of education behind it. But even when you do, I mean, I was really fortunate when I was learning because I was taught, it was like university. I would prep my case and then Surinder would check it before I would take the impression. Then I would take the impression and then Surinder would check it before I could send to the, put the temps on, you know, so every stage, stage was checked. Um, and that's what, how I, until I, until I was good enough that you didn't need to check anymore. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that not everyone has that. So little things will go wrong along the way. You know, the impression won't be good enough. So, you know, nowadays I'll, I'll take one impression before I always took two. So if there was something, a margin or something there that, that, that lab can't see, and it's so many units, at least they've got two, two mm -hmm. impressions to, that they can, they can look at. Um, anyway, back to cementing. Um, and then uh, you pl place all, all the videos on and make sure they're, they're all nicely seasoned. And then I clean up. So I take a brush and I clean up all the excess. And then um, I'll, I, I want to floss. And um, sometimes, mostly, I'll feel nervous about flossing without some sort of cure. So this is a dangerous part. And your nurse needs to be very good. And so again, mm. I'm very strict with this. Uh, that I, I hold, I start on, on one side, I hold the veneer in place. Um, I, I, I'll hold it in place with maybe like a scalo or I, I use something to hold it. And then I'll use my finger to cover the tooth next door. And then I'll tell her to spot cure. So if you have a spot cure light, that's fine. And, and, and anyway, regardless, whatever light cure you're using, she goes onto the gingival margin and she goes one, two and moves away. And that's how mm. she has to do it. She moves in, she, and she said out loud, one, two, and then she physically moves away so that I can see what's going on. And then I do the same thing, place the next one, make sure it's perfect. Um, and then she is. And then, so then they, they're cured, but they're only cured for like a second or so. Um, and so, uh, and then I can floss. So then I go through yeah. and I floss them all. So only once you tack cure them all, then you start flossing. And are you still quite yeah, gentle as you're flossing? Very gentle, because it's yeah. still soft. The cement, mm -hmm. you need it to be soft and you need to be gentle. Now, you also need perfect oral hygiene because you cannot cement to blood. And again, I've done this in the past. Even if they look good, but there's a little bit of blood, blood's gone under the veneer and then they've got a black veneer because that blood stays there and it stains. So now my patients, I will not touch them until their oral hygiene is perfect. And they know that. They have to keep seeing the hygienist. They have to change the way they clean at home. They have to be flossing. They have to be brushing twice a day with an electric toothbrush. Um, and then, it, yeah. So that, I mean, that's just so floss, foundational, but I'm so glad you said it because, you know, you, you have such a, a beautiful uh, Instagram profile. You have so many great cases, but uh, we don't appreciate that what you're doing. You're, you got the foundation set first uh, from good mentorship, the really good uh, gingival health, which is so imperative to bonding veneers. So I'm so glad you've mentioned oh that. So it's not about the bits and glam at the end. It's about having uh, proper dentistry with good, respecting the biology. And so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really pleased you've mentioned that. Well, there's this other Instagram uh, veneers, veneer guy that's got like, I don't know, 250,000 followers. Um, and uh, one of his patients came, came to see me and she was like, oh, you know, he's flying into to London and he, he works between LA and London. And um, I'm having my veneers done with him tomorrow and he's charging me like 50 grand. And I suddenly panicked and someone told me that I should be seeing you and can, can you have a look at my, my teeth? And I had a look and she had raging gingivitis. And because he hadn't done a consultation at all, she just messaged saying she wanted 10 veneers. And he said, I'm flying in on this day. I'll do them for you. And then I don't know how he was planning on doing them um, with her bleeding gums. But anyway, that's no, the whole does, does sense, <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you are advocating the, the correct way. So you've now flossed. Uh, oh, yeah, and then for me. Yeah. All of this is, it makes my life easy. The less I prep, the less sensitivity they're going to have, the less likely they're going to need a root canal, the less problems I have. My biggest practice builder is referrals, right? Every patient mm -hmm. that comes to me, I want them to replace themselves with another patient. And the only way I'm going to do that is if they love my work, 
they enjoy coming to see me and they don't have any problems. So that's the way my practice has had to evolve to be, to have been doing this for so many years and my patients be coming back to me 10 years later when it was time 15 years later to replace their veneers um, and coming, finding me to do it. Um, it's because, you know, you have, you have to practice like that. Practice, awesome. Really. So just to finish off the bonding protocol, you're now gently flossed. Are you, are you now picking up a light cure to clean, clean up? My nurse is light curing. So at least 40 seconds on each tooth individually, but then yeah, they probably end up getting 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 60. I know some dentists put glycerine at the margin too. I don't. I did learn with Pascal Manier and probably did it for a while and then stopped. Um, and so I don't put glycerine, but they do get a really good cure. And then once they've all been cured, I take um, a polishing burr, and that is uh eight five six ef dot three one four dot oh one two and um i remove all the excess composite at the margin that's really really important to do that while mm -hmm. they're numb because you don't want any cement there because that will cause gingival inflammation and if you get in the session then that's a disaster mm -hmm. um and uh then i take if, if i'll floss and if there is a little bit of cement stuck there then i'll take a serrated strip clean in between the teeth then I'll take a yellow metal strip and still clean in between the teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I need, and then I take a, a yellow rugby ball and I clean the back, uh, the margin between the porcelain and the tooth, uh, remove any cement there. So how many um, hours would that, uh, would a typical fit of, let's say eight units, uh, for example, take you? So I will book two hours, but it will take an hour. And the reason I always book longer is because I want my patients to feel like they have a lot of time. Like if they want to stop and they want to talk and, or they want to, you know, whatever they want to do, we'll do. And I don't want them to ever feel like I'm rushing to see another patient. So, yeah. Brilliant. So um, now you've... Uh, then we check occlusion. Yes, yeah, perfect. Check occlusion. <laughs> yeah, check occlusion, check everything looks good. I warn them before they come that their lips are going to be swollen so they won't be able to tell what they look like. And I say, don't even worry about it. Go ahead, go go home, go relax, book a review appointment. It's always booked for two days later and they come in and that's when we look at them. And then if we want to, we can make some small changes um, with shape if I want to mm -hmm, make them mm -hmm, look more round mm -hmm. or more square. But to be fair, 95% of the time there's no change because we've already done all that in the templates. So, and if there are, there are minor changes and we make them. Has it ever happened to you? Because because this is something that I speak to dentists and, and a lot of dentists have described this scenario is like you do some veneers. I mean, I think it probably doesn't happen to you because your temporization process sounds really good, but they do some veneers and then they go back to their partner or husband or family and then someone makes a comment and they come back and, and they're a bit upset that, oh, this person didn't like them or um, uh, someone said this and then they're suddenly uh, debating, uh, have I made the wrong decision? Uh, has that, have you encountered that scenario? Did they, did they come to you for advice like that? Has that happened to you? Yeah. So, so all that. my patients, I would say, all my patients say, I wish I'd done this sooner. So they all love it in the end. Um, but definitely they can come back at the temporary stage and, and have opinions. And I ask them to ask for opinions. It's like, you've got two days between your, your prep appointment and your, and your review appointment. So go and ask opinions. Make sure you show your husband or wife, show your friends and come back to me. And then whatever comments they come back with, we, we manage them. So it's all managed at the temporary stage. So by the time you get to fix, they, they, they love them. And even at the temporary stage, we don't leave that until they love them. Um, I know you said before, how long have I, have I gone through the temporary stage with just modifications? I think I told you about the six-month guy. And that wasn't modifications. He just didn't want to come back. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't leave them intent, intentionally for longer than a month. And, and actually, 95% of the time, it, the modifications are made and they're happy within that review appointment. And um, it's rare mm -hmm. that I need to get them back. But there certainly has been cases when, when I yeah. got them back. Um, but, but I wouldn't leave them for longer than a month. Like within a month, we have to get there. Are the temporaries like a TPable? Is that what you advocate them to like religiously TP them? Yeah. Yes. So they have to clean it and their gingival health has to be optimal for the fit appointment mm -hmm. uh, because I can't have any bleeding. So I give them TPs, pink TPs and Corsodil gel. Um, and, we, and we have a look. So they, they need to brush twice a day with their electric toothbrush. Then they rinse with Peroxyl. I get them to rinse with Peroxyl. And then I get mm -hmm. them to dip their TP brushes in Corsodil gel. And um, I use my little mosquito board for that I think I gave you the code for earlier, 582, um, yep. <laughs> to go and make sure there's, there's smell. Look at these codes. I love that I've just got these handy. Uh, <laughs> looking very organized. Very good. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, open up and make sure that they, it's not a visible hole, but to make sure they can get in there. Um, put the gel in uh, and leave it there so they don't, uh, they don't rinse it off. And they do that twice a day. So, yeah, it becomes a, a beautiful when they come for this. Beautiful. So now I've got my final three questions because we'll have to, to wrap up. We could speak forever about yeah. veneers, but there's final three questions. Yeah. So um, they are, and I'll list them together and you can then, uh, answer them. One is, 
when does a veneer become a crown for you? So when do you think actually, no, I'm not going to veneer this. I'm going to go for traditional uh, retention resistance form. So when does a veneer become a crown? The next question I'll ask you then after that will be just your final tips for success to, to young dentists. Uh, and the last one, uh, you know, please tell us about, uh, you know, I think you, you're obviously doing some veneer courses. Tell us about uh, what that involves and uh, what, what, what dates, because I think this episode will probably be coming out in late Feb, I think. So tell us about uh, what dates uh, are available. So those three questions, when is a veneer a crown? Tips for young dentists and tell us about your course. because you know, It sounds cool. like some Got good it. stuff. <laughs> So uh, first of all, uh, I don't crown very often at all. Um, and also I don't differentiate between veneers, three quarter veneers and crowns price wise. I tell my patients that I'm gonna prep however I need to prep, uh, whatever I need to remove to, to get the best result for you. Um, the, uh, can, the only thing, reason that I would crown is maybe uh, I've got a patient recently that came in, or I've had two actually last week that had really a lot of palatal wear uh, from bulimia um, or acid reflux. I mean, I think they were both bulimia as a child, as children. Um, and even for those cases, I would rather put uh, composite veneers on the palatal and then porcelain veneers on the labial. Uh, just with the, you know, if there's a grind, normally there's a grinding habit there as well. I don't want them grinding on, on porcelain. And so it's still nice to do two veneers. Um, but yeah, you could do, sometimes you need to do, you need to do a three quarter, you may just do a full coverage um, and then it's a crown. So yeah, veneer crown. So no, I don't like to differentiate. It's just whatever needs the minimum sure. amount of tooth tissue that needs to be removed um, to get the result. To get the job done. Um, cool. Get the job done. And then uh, for dentists wanting, uh, my advice to young dentists is um, is learning. Um, and I think I talk about this a lot on my Instagram page. Um, I spent a lot of money on my education uh, all through my career, even even now, even you know, in like 2019. Um, and people have always like questioned the amount that I spent, saying, "Wow, you you spent so much on your on your education." And I was flying around the world and getting my education, and you don't need to do that anymore, but you did back then. Um, because there's, there's really good UK courses now um, and uh, don't be scared of that like if you want if you're interested in something interested in something and you want to learn about it then learn about it properly go on a course and learn about it and don't be scared about the expense of it because you will only earn more from what you've learned um, and so yeah I always say to dentists so they don't get bored and so that they're, they're building up what they can do you know keep go, go on a simple ortho course learn about that put that into practice you know go on a whitening course learn about that definitely go on an occlusion course um, if you're interested in smile design then come on a smile design course <laughs> and that leads on to question number three please um, well there are smile design courses in the uk i mean maybe there wasn't one that everyone was knew about um oh there wasn't i don't know maybe there wasn't the best one i, I think yeah there, there, there probably are good ones um i did my studies in uh, in america i did the aesthetic advantage in new york over three years with larry rosenthal um, and APA, um, you, and um and, you know, I had to fly to New York and it cost me £7,000 to do each level, uh, $7,000. And I did it. And I had to fly my patient out there. And it was amazing. And, and that was great. But um, that is really so cool. Any... So you flew your patient uh, to, to you, yeah. your, your patient, flew, like, were, they, were, they, were they sat next to you oh, on the, on, on the airplane? No, 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 no. <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, they'd, could we go for lectures as well? And then they'd come and we do the preps, they'd fly back. And it was the same thing. Two weeks later, they'd come and they'd fly again. So I'm very much... I'm not emulating that for what in my course, what I'm doing here, but I'm offering a similar service um, here because it really wasn't something like that. And that education is what I needed. And that's what kickstarted my career for me. And I'm offering that same thing. There are far too many dentists that are trying to do these cases and don't know how to do them. So their work's failing and then their patients are coming to see me and I'm having to redo it. And there are mm -hmm. far too many dentists prepping crowns rather than veneers. Even my, my friends are doing it when I talk to them because they're scared their veneers will fall off. So I don't want people mm -hmm. to do that anymore. So I'm offering a course that gives you a really nice outline. And the people on my course at this time, you know, have had a range of skills from someone who's only been graduated two years. And certainly when I went and did the course, started the course in New, year, in New York, I'd only been graduated two years to another guy who's been graduated 20 years and done a restorative MSc, but really not done any smart makeovers. So it's one thing to do, do an MSc and another thing to actually learn about how it work, works in practice with something that I've been doing every day for the last 18 years because you know even now i work in a cosmetic practice all we do is cosmetic work we don't do general dentistry so this is my everyday job um and there's so there's a lot of lot of tips and tricks that i can give you about how to make this predictable make it minimally invasive make it you don't have any problems and go through the things that went wrong for me and make sure they don't go wrong for you and also support you then moving forward because i had a lot of support and you need that 
Um, so at least then there's a support network there uh, moving forward. Um, so we have the course dates that, that are running now, but the next ones are in June. I'll just uh, put the, the I'll put the dates and the and the link on the blog post along Perfect. with this uh, yeah, video. Exactly. That'd be really good. So twenty twenty. Yeah, come and come come you, down. You, it's many. You owe me some some website. You owe me some dates yes. and you owe me some bar yes. codes. Yes, <laughs> done. I will send them all. Where is it? Is it central London? Yeah, so it's being held at the clinic where I work, the London Smile Clinic in <clears throat> Fitzrovia. So really easy to get to. I can give you hotel details for people who are flying in. This time we had someone flying from Sweden, someone flying from Dubai, and then obviously the others well from, done. from the UK. Yeah. And so, flying the I flag mean, for, for, for UK dentists and flying the flag for, 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 for women dentists. So uh, that's, that's really, really good. And that's, like we said at the beginning, right? My, my wife was happy that uh, I'm, I'm bringing a uh, very successful and very good uh, woman dentist. Uh, so, you Thank know, you. I, I, I echo all the people's thoughts and views that have been reaching out to you with positivity. And I think that's exactly with, you know, on behalf of me and my listeners, I, I wish you all the best with it. I think uh, I wish all the women in dentistry the best, but I'm, I'm just so pleased that I had you on as a role model uh, for the women Thank in you. dentistry. Uh, and the three really nice stories I, I got from this episode from you is um, your, the, the, the role of mentorship. That was it yeah. in your career. So and I'm always banging on about, I'm always banging on about that mentorship, uh, how you've invested so much time and money to spend time in the dirt. What I mean by dirt is you've actually mm. worked your socks off, uh, courses, yeah. learning, There's no space failing, for you can't, yeah. Bring up systems, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and, and then just now your attitude to, to give back through uh, all the posts that you put on, on Instagram and also now the course you're running. So uh, you've been a brilliant guest to, to interview Manrina. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me.